Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to the uh, fifth, I believe, uh, version of this kind of Tom Nicholas live stream thing. Uh, I really want to stop calling it that. I know I said this at the beginning, everyone. I really want to just not be saying my name at the beginning of all of them. Um, but welcome uh, to those of you who have been before. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you very much for uh, putting up with uh, this again. Uh, it's much appreciated if you have not been, uh, if you're new around here, then thank you so much for coming along. It's much appreciated. Uh, do uh, pop things in the chat um, and get uh, involved. I'll keep an eye on it and um, any sort of good points, which I'm sure they will all be good points and all be good questions, but uh, I will uh, try and throw those into the conversation uh, as well. Uh, it's been really fun over these past sort of couple of months now. Uh, I've had a bunch of uh, different uh, guests on, which has been uh, great. Uh, in fact, I think everyone I've asked to come on has come on, which has been uh, lovely. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and all of those are up on this channel if you want to watch any of those. So Tristan from Step Back History, we've had uh, Grace Lee from What's So Great About That last week was a um, really fascinating conversation about sort of visual culture. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much for being here again. Uh, let me know if there's any technical hitches in the chat. There usually is something to do with sound or uh, visuals or you know anything uh, and also before we uh, get going a very quick thank you to those people who support me on patreon uh, for for doing that uh, that is very much appreciated and sort of makes this as well as my actual proper videos uh, sort of possible so thank you uh, but I have uh, another guest another esteemed guest uh, this week uh, who's uh, I'm, I'm, uh, from the from the chat uh, I'm guessing uh, some of your fans are here John uh, which is uh, exciting. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you you may have seen uh, his videos online. You may have uh, listened to his uh, podcast. You may have read his uh, always entertaining Twitter uh, feed. Uh, I'm absolutely uh, delighted uh, to be joined uh, by John, a.k.a. the Lit Crit Guy. How are you, John? Uh, hey, thank you so much for um, inviting me on. I'm very good. Hello to everybody who is... Uh, in the chat and listening along um yeah and uh, again thanks so much for bringing me on i'm really looking forward to our conversation no it's an absolute pleasure uh, to have you i mean i was i was just saying to you before we began i'm a very uh, belated arrival arriver to your work uh, i'm afraid i think it's one, one of those things with the internet where you can sort of really know one space that you're in and then there can be whole other bits that exist um and i stumbled across uh, your uh, video on John Berger and John Berger's way, uh, ways, ways of seeing and then like binge watched all your videos from the past uh, few months that's like something super new that you've been doing is that correct yeah 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 so I um I I'm assuming some people might not know who I am um my name is John oh yeah introduce writer. yourself I always end I always do like an intro for people and then I'm like but that might not be the way you want to be introduced so please introduce yourself uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm John. I go by the Liquid Guy online. I am a uh, writer and a podcaster, and now, as I describe myself, a tiny fledgling YouTuber. Um, so I talk about I talk about critical and cultural theory. I talk about Marxism, um, and for the last couple of years, I've talked a lot about um, horror. Uh, that is because of the podcast that I am co-host of. It's called the Horror Vanguard, where we talk about um, radical politics and um horror movies so if you if you are into those things um if you like the if you know that the biggest monster that we are currently dealing with is neoliberal capitalism please you you might enjoy the podcast um but yeah i started writing and and, and tweeting uh, about uh theory broadly defined um marxist theory in particular um and i have just started making um, YouTube videos. I've made one on Lauren Ballant's concept of cruel optimism. Um, I made one on Mark Fisher's The Weird and the Eerie. Um, and the last one I put out um, a little while ago was on John Berger's um, landmark ways of seeing. Maybe we'll have to have a chat about I know um, some people that uh, come along to these uh, and watch my stuff are sort of doing uh, uh, research or, or debating doing uh, PhDs or whatever themselves maybe we'll have a chat a little bit about uh, the carrot of academia in PhDs at some point uh, in a way that perhaps is not too uh, not positive if that makes sense um, <laughs> but like in a way that's sort of a, a nice realistic chat about that maybe at some point 
Um, but yeah, yeah I, I've I've yet to catch up on your podcast. That is, I feel like uh, your extended universe is still <laughs> open to me, and I still need to uh, catch up properly on. Um, but yeah, thank yeah. I mean, so so as I was saying, um, um, I think it was it was it was that video on John Berger, which was the first uh, that I stumbled across. But it's been really great uh, catching up on uh, your videos. I was saying to you just before, I really enjoyed your uh, video on uh, Mark Fisher's The Weird and Eerie as well. Um, I think a lot of people are aware of uh, Mark Fisher's work and um, particularly uh, particularly capitalist realism. I think uh, you can barely watch a uh, video by a left-leaning person on YouTube without someone uh, suggesting that it is easier to uh, imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. Yep, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, um, but yeah, and it was really interesting to see you actually exploring um, some of his uh, other work um, I'm really, I really enjoy his work on uh, ontology as well, which is something I've been sort of thinking about making a video about at some point, but I don't know why. We're getting yeah. some uh, a few shouts out for your uh, podcast in the uh, chat, which is nice. Some some John, uh, John fans around. Yeah, yeah. Um, Thank you very much to everyone who listens <laughs> to HV. It is much appreciated. So, um, I mean, tell me, maybe let's start from maybe let's start from that uh, that John Berger video. Let's then work our way back to uh, the, the sort of main thing I wanted to discuss today was uh, given that you are, uh, that you have, uh, that you, you know, spend your life discussing uh, literature and movies, um, I'm sure from uh, multiple different uh, angles. And given that I have uh, decided to put a lot of time into making some videos about various um, cultural theory uh, elements, um, I thought it'd be interesting to chat about sort of less the content of particular frames but why we bother doing that in the first place you know why why is it that rather than looking at a a book or a, a film or a performance or a, a piece of visual art a s statue uh is the uh the uh current popular uh thing uh or unpopular thing maybe statues um <laughs> Uh, why it is we bought, sort of even bother applying these frames, but maybe let's start from um, sort of what inspired that um, John Burge video. I think what what I really enjoyed about it was that it was. I mean, I, I think as you say in in the video that John Burge just sort of changed not only the way you look at a particular text, but the way you look at texts generally. Um, yeah. What uh, take me back to the moment where you first uh, opened put on BBC4 and or open to the book Ways of Seeing. Um, no, you don't have to totally describe it in that way. But um, <laughs> but, uh, but what was it in particular about Ways of Seeing that um, in, inspired you to think differently about the cultural texts you uh, consume is the popular word, but I don't know, engage with? Yeah, so there's a couple of reasons why I made the video. So firstly, on a kind of like meta level, I think YouTube can be a really good place for criticism and critique. And I have, I think quite a lot of people uh, have a kind of contrarian streak in them. And so I decided that I didn't want to do a criticism. I didn't want to do like a, a video that was really negative. And instead what I wanted to do, I've decided I'm going to make this a series on my channel. Um, I was going to do an essay of appreciation of someone who mm. was very kind of foundational in how I think about things um, and try and put some of their ideas into practice. So um the, that was why I, I, I sort of turned to John Berger. Um, and the other reason I decided to do it is because I often think that there is popular criticism around around culture, like the culture of, re of reviewing, of like the, the discourse, as it were, can often be very reductive. So mm -hmm. we get drawn into, oh, is text A good or bad? Mm -hmm. um and is text b better than text a and maybe we should rank all of i don't know like the marvel films in order of how good they are and there's this great quote by berger where he says um it's in an old black and white um spot on tv that he did he said um the ranking of artists in an order of merit seems to me to be an idle game what matters are the needs that art answers so this idea of going, well, who's the best artist? What's the best film? What's the best is, is just kind of game playing. And it isn't actually asking the most important question, which is what is art doing and what needs socially speaking, does art respond to and meet? 
so I think that's why um, that's why kind of John Berger is so attractive to me. I think you're, I think you're right, and and particularly like a few years ago, I think that really dominated, like particularly YouTube, but also like BuzzFeed and whatever, like that kind of BuzzFeed culture of everything gets ranked or or the contrarian let's dunk on something that everyone loves um, for the sake of being the person to point out why thing that shaped your entire childhood is bad um yeah and even even i think in a lot of the uh current stuff and um, i'm think, thinking particularly like uh lindsay ellis who i say in these chat streams a lot that i like really love her work and i think she she describes it as um she likes to look at things that could have worked but didn't or that she like yeah. mostly like or, or that she wishes she liked so, th so there is that kind of almost the wanting to love it but there's still the element of like but uh, here's the things that don't work about it, um, and I think that really came across in your uh, in your video. That thing of actually, yeah, some positivity is nice. Yeah, absolutely. And this idea that maybe things can be uh, complex. That mm. even even things which are which are like seemingly banal or seemingly really straightforward um, can be really really. Um, interesting if you look at them in in enough detail and if you take them seriously as kind of objects there's in ways of seeing uh the book there's this really famous section where berger talks about um a portrait by gainsborough and it's a portrait of a landowning couple mm -hmm. um and you know the common art historian discourse is this is a great example of gainsborough's mature work but berger says actually yes it is that but it's also a cultural reflection of issues like the enclosure and privatization of land. Um, the fact that these are land owners that would kind of see that land as a, as a private asset rather than a public shared space. That's, that's is that the one where they're sort of gazing across their fields? Uh, yes. So crack, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the one. And, and people got really annoyed at Berger for pointing this out that actually, you know, you, you can't, you can't, you can't bring, you can't bring, political or historical factors into art art is art and art is good with a capital g but the whole point of a good critic is that by looking seriously and closely at a particular work not only do you kind of appreciate you can appreciate it of course i i always find that thinking critically about something often helps me to appreciate it more and articulate why i like something but i also think it's really important to be able to see art as something that is social something that we do mm um as as a group it's something that's produced by the ways that we live and therefore it has something to say about those ways i think you i think you described uh burge's work in your video as sort of bringing together political economy and aesthetics in an interesting way and i think what's what's interesting to me in the way that uh burge puts it all forward is that he puts it forward from a sort of democratizing background that to, to talk just about the brush strokes and just about the composition and the i don't really know much about visual art the you know the way the perspective um i think that's all the keywords about visual art i have <laughs> uh but um the, but the, to look at it in in that way is that is more obfuscatory is more more trying to um make it complex and um unapproachable to sort of normal people whereas i think quite I think often people uh, have that reaction to taking a post-colonial or feminist or um, whatever lens to stuff. They go, well, actually, no, that's the thing that's making it highbrow and making it um, uh, uh, making it unapproachable is that, you know, you're bringing all this language to discussing art where maybe people just want to um, enjoy it. But I think there's something interesting about how he's talking about how actually contextualizing the work actually can make it more accessible yeah and actually this is a big problem that he identifies with a lot of a lot of um criticism in the art world and i honestly think this is true of credit of like cultural criticism more widely is that art critics got very protective about art being unique and being special mm. um and you had to have a certain kind of educational background to understand it but also we exist in a time where art has never been more widely accessible. Um, it has been, um, uh, it has, it's gone everywhere. 
you know, we live in the age of mechanical reproduction, to quote the title of a very famous um, essay. So what that means is that art has kind of lost its mystique. Uh, but that isn't necessarily, necessarily a problem. It's a problem if you think that that means art is somehow devalued. But if you put art into the hands of more people, Berger always saw it as a very, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, it's a democratic impulse, this idea that anyone can access art. And what that means is that the ways of looking at art, no longer do you have the one singular correct interpretation. Instead, you have a kind of multiplicity of ways of looking and using and responding to art. Mm. Um, quite an interesting question in the chat, uh, actually. We've got a few interesting questions. Um, I'm going to go... How do I get the chat up? There we go. Um, I'm going to go from the, the last one from Richard. Thank you for dropping this in, Richard. Um, who's asking um, sort of how, how this fits into the Marxist notion of an economic base and cultural uh, superstructure. Um, I mean, this is sort of very much what Burgess uh, getting at is considering actually how does uh, how does both the the text itself, uh, whether that's a painting or a um, I mean primarily it's paintings in um, or um, sometimes it's adver advertising uh, in ways of seeing. Um, mm. Actually, sort of what he's doing, I suppose, Richard is. Um, trying to recontextualize that within the economic base and actually going, how does this function? Um, I think the interesting stuff is, um, for me, is often th the ways in which he's asking not only how does this function as a uh, piece of art in a kind of, um, you know, which we do often view as like disconnected from the world in the lovely bubble of art and culture, um, whereas actually what um, one of the lenses that John Berger brings to it, at least, is to go, actually, how does both this painting operate as a thing that is bought and sold, um, uh, often for huge sums of money? Um, I think art is one of the few commodities that rarely loses value, I think, if you buy the right thing. Um, I think, on average, stuff tends to go up in value, um, although I'm sure none of my paintings ever would. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, uh, but no, I think I think people, people, you know, people with lots of money tend to think of particularly like work that is already pretty revered as a really good store of money. You know, if you buy a even if you buy a sort of uh, unknown Picasso, it's always going to be a Picasso and increase in value. Um, uh, and he's also asking, how does art work as a reflection of wealth? I think um, I find the the really interesting um, bit of ways of seeing for me is that bit where he's talking about like people surrounded by stuff when it's just like yes. here's a painting of people surrounded by stuff and how this painting becomes not only a painting of that person but also sort of a sort of it's sort of symbolic capital a way of showing here's all the stuff that i and the land and the land like you were just saying um so i think uh i don't know if you've got more on, on more to say john on, on how this sort of connects with those ideas of uh sort of base and superstructure yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really good and important question. So Berger's whole point is actually to put cultural production into the realm of production, right? It is not just, it isn't disinterested from materialism. It isn't, it isn't a universal form that kind of floats above history that kind of is just great art. Art always comes from something. It always comes from somewhere. Um, and it is intimately bound up with the capitalist mode of production. Um, in the video, I talk a little bit about um, a very famous painting by Hans Holbein called The Ambassadors, um, which is all about depicting wealth. And you can, instead of talking about, ah, so it's, it, look, let's talk about brushstrokes and color and aesthetics. Berger goes, actually, no, let's talk about what this painting actually shows us. Let's look at it as revealing something of um, that relationship between base and superstructure. Uh, art, any kind of cultural production is intimately bound up within economic means of production. Uh, like even in the context of YouTube, right? To good microphones cost money, cameras cost money. You can be as creative and artistic in your um, editing and shot selection as you like, but we are bound up within modes of capitalist production. You know, there are there are ads that surround every single video on the on on the website and we can't get away from that. 
So I think it's really important to be able to do what Berger did, which is actually place art into its economic context. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go, oh, well, it's all solely determined by by these things because it's all solely determined by capitalism. But but it allows us to ask more interesting questions about what's the relationship between creativity and economics, for example. Holbein was a brilliant painter. Uh, Franz Hals is an incredible painter. Uh, but those that artistic talent is not something that we should consider just by itself, right? We should consider it in the context that Franz Hals was incredibly poor and relied on the charity of the people whose portraits he painted. Um, Holbein went to England to work on commission uh, as a way of making making his living. So the big point that Berger is basically getting at, and maybe now it sounds quite obvious, but that's only because of his work and, and others like him, is that art is not something that is distinct from um, capitalist modes of production. And in fact, the emergence of particular artistic traditions, um, you know, Tom, you were talking about oil painting, which depicts things, that, that artistic tradition only emerged because of the way that capitalism developed across Europe. Mm. And I think um, the sort of old school way of looking at uh, sort of base and, and superstructure was very much uh, sort of the uh, sort of what's often referred to as the, the sort of vulgar Marxist approach is that everything is one way determined and that, um, you know, the, the means of production uh, and the economic base sort of determine the superstructure and that there's never any like reciprocating processes um and i think uh you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who entirely subscribed to that view um these days um partly uh, well um you know my my view through that is probably through raymond williams who's um another uh sort of british cultural theorist um and author actually so possibly um spans a similar position uh to berger um and I uh, will manage to crowbar into any conversation uh, in the world ever. Um, but and he actually looks at actually how uh, how does culture also have a political effect on the world? Um, yeah. And that there's not that clear binary of one thing always leading uh, to another. Some of this is really uh, useful for me planning my video on ideology that I was, <laughs> I was telling you about before, John, actually. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, that, that thing of actually, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um uh, so yeah, so so I think yeah, that's that's a really interesting um, uh, question. Thank you, Richard. That was a really good, uh, good little discussion. So, so this is sort of one one way of looking at things. Is this sort of um, uh, I mean, ultimately Marxist, but I suppose you could call it mm, post-Marxist. I don't know. Um, or sort of cultural materialist is the um, phrase that I'd slap on it, but. Um, yeah. Uh, the, where we're looking at art and we're not just looking at it as this wonderful vaunted thing. I mean, someone commented, uh, it was Richard again, actually, uh, was saying that, that, you know, the work of art, actually, as well as the work of art, which is a lovely wordplay. Um, uh, that, and, and then that sort of um, one way of looking at it is going, actually, how does this art not just a um, aesthetic object, but also how is it bound up in the social world and in social relations and economic relations um, but this is kind of only sort of one lens we can apply to stuff um, uh, as I sort of mentioned uh, a bit earlier I think it'd be cool to talk a little bit about um, why do we apply uh, different lenses how might we choose um, certain lenses for certain conversations and certain things we might want to get about out of art and i mean it might go back to that point that you made a little while ago john about asking the question about what uh what i can't remember exactly what you said now so sort of what desires of society does a piece of um art respond to or what what questions mm. does it respond to about society i mean in your own work um when you're you know looking at a, a horror film or a um a, a, a sort of gothic novel uh, what are some of the sort of theoretical lenses you find yourself most often using, if you don't mind me um, asking? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I would definitely, I would definitely use a lot of that cultural and historical materialism. I describe myself as a Marxist. 
um, mostly because that has a kind of intellectual tradition that I find really useful mm. um, in clarifying how cultural texts relate to the societies which produce them and enjoy them. Um, in horror, um, because a lot of horror is subject, um, is, a, is, is very subjective and it's about interiority, we talk a lot about psychoanalysis, about um, anxiety, anxiety and desire. Um, and these are two things which are not necessarily distinct from economics, right? They're not necessarily distinct from cultural materialism. Um, you know, if you think about uh, the, the great example that I always use is that in the aftermath of 9-11, George W. Bush, president of the United States, went on the TV and he said, we need Americans to keep shopping. Mm. So there had been this kind of big, horrific national trauma. But what you need is you needed for there to be a kind of like economic way out of this. So there's an explicit connection there, right, between um, anxiety on a cultural level, um, fear on a cultural level and uh, material forces like economics. And so for me, those two those two um, theoretical lenses really inform one another and we can understand how something that might be personally impactful on us, but also how that personal impact reflects wider impacts uh, on a societal or cultural level. Yeah, that's interesting. And so and um, if, are there any particular uh, particular psychoanalytic scholars that you uh, find yourself drawing on in trying to identify those uh, sort of I suppose sort of societal anxieties, maybe is what you're um, talking about. Is it you know does it go back to Freud, to Lacan? Um, those are the those are the two psychoanalytic scholars I'm most yeah. aware of. Uh, um, yeah, Freud and Lacan, obviously. Um, I always find I always have this kind of weird antagonistic relationship to Lacanian theory. Um, because I've always said, oh, I don't do, I don't do Lacan. I don't do Lacan. I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in that. And I always find myself constantly talking about it, which I think is very psychoanalytically revealing about me. Mm. Um, I, do, I don't know what that says. I don't know if that's good <laughs> or not. The other, the other big figure is, um, is the French, uh, duo, um, Deleuze and Guattari, mm -hmm. who, uh, wrote brilliantly about these intersections of capitalism and desire. Um, and there's a kind of tradition that comes out of that, that, you know, it's modern version can be found in people like Slavo Zizek, um, who uh, is one of those figures that I, again, I kind of have this antagonistic relationship towards mm. uh, where I go, yeah, no, I don't want to talk about Zizek, but I always find myself talking about it. So there is this um, way of understanding kind of what is the individual's relationship to the society in which we live. Uh, but again, you can put that in more materialist terms, as someone like Raymond Williams or Stuart Hall have written about. Um, and how do those and how do these kind of psychological or, or psychoanalytic impulses find their expression? Uh, and again, you've got you've got two different ways of looking at that. You can go into a Lacanian, a much more kind of French route, or we can kind of look at it from um, something that I've been reading a lot of at the moment is um, the Frankfurt School. So writers like um, Horkheimer and Adorno and um, Herbert Marcuse wrote extensively about what is capitalist society doing to us um, psychologically mm -hmm. and subjectively speaking. I think I've been thinking, um, we've been thinking a lot about, about work at the Frankfurt School uh, recently and a lot of, um, a lot of that sort of slight, slightly later sort of, a lot of the sort of writing that came out of the sort of period around 68. Um, mm. So for the, 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 those of you who aren't aware, sort of the 1968 May in particular was like a, a big year for politics and particularly in, um, particularly in France, although it sort of had, there were sort of other movements elsewhere in the world, um, whether it was sort of opposition to Vietnam or whether it was, um, uh, or, or the sort of particular event in um, Paris where they pretty much almost shut down the government. Um, I think Charles de Gaulle got, um, who's the prime minister, president, got uh, evacuated. Um, and there's a lot of uh, sort of writing that happened at this time before, slightly before it or afterwards. Um, and I've been thinking, thinking a lot about some of that work and uh, so, so Marcuse, but also... Um, Society of the Spectacle and also um, uh, Everyday Life. I uh, can't think what I'm trying to 
Oh, the critique of everyday life. Yeah, and that, that yeah, yeah. And, and the sort of broader work around everyday life and Lefebvre's right to the city, etc. Um, and sort of thinking about how the ways in which it does apply to now and the ways in which it doesn't, um, which is which I think um, uh, there's quite a lot of uh, sort of discussion on YouTube about society of the spectacle. Every so often pops up. Um, and uh, I sort of did a mini series about it a while ago as well. And so I quite often get questions there about it. Um, and I often find there's a lot that it does say about the present day, but also a lot that we now live in a very different iteration of capitalism. Um, sort of a lot of that work is written for the very uh, relatively stable, um, relatively sort of post-war social democracy, I suppose. Um, whereas we're now at kind of a, a very for sort of very different form of capitalism i suppose um i wondered if you could speak to that slightly rambled thought at all <laughs> yeah i mean in 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 a way yes i think we are but also um i mean mackenzie walk has uh, their new book mm. where they ask the very provocative question of um is this capitalism or is this something worse um mm. and yeah you know uh, what, what we might call Fordist capitalism, the capitalism that was there in the 60s, which was very industrial focused, um, as particularly in, in Europe and America, doesn't really exist in the same way anymore. Um, but in many ways, we are actually in a uh, in a system which has a lot in, in common with almost like early 19th century capitalism where you have mm. massive monopolies you have huge changes in technological advancement um you have the relative absence of of kind of a union movement uh of uh working class people um and you have uh, huge injustice but like i i also think it's important to this is something that comes up quite a lot and um there's a great quote from an essay written in the early 1900s by the Hungarian writer Georgi Lukács, um, and it's called "What Is Orthodox Marxism?" And uh, Lukács says, "If if it turned out that Marx was wrong about everything, if it was all complete rubbish, that anyone who called himself a Marxist wouldn't have to suddenly, uh, you know, convert mm -hmm. for the simple reason that Marxism, and I think this is true of any kind of theoretical." or intellectual approach you might want to take. Marxism is not a dogma, it's a method. It's a way of looking at the world. And I, I think it's very cool that people are so interested in society of the spectacle, but I think the danger is that we turn the theoretical writings of the past into fixed dogma that you kind of have to religiously convert to, you have to ascribe to. And in fact, it's much better, I think, to see it as methods and ways of working, tools actually, that are useful to be put into practice rather than, you know, constantly getting drawn into often very abstract historical debate about, well, what about this day in 1968? <laughs> yeah. um, they're useful for describing where we were, and they help us to understand how we arrived to this uh, present moment. But if you turn any kind of theory into a dogma, you turn it into something static, you turn it into something that is a kind of reified or concrete object. And in fact, it's much better to see these ways of, of looking at looking at things, these these theoretical lenses that you were talking about are tools. They're ways of helping us um, work into a better future rather than something that we're supposed to constantly be trying to recreate from the past. In fact, I think I think I think that's the thought I've been trying to have in my own brain. Uh, and you have expressed it very eloquently there. Um, I think you're right that, that there's there's so many bits and pieces and terminology and tools like that we can bring forward to the the present but i think you're right in saying that i think sometimes the approach is to go um particularly some of those um really evocatively written stuff i think particularly like society spectacle so evocatively written and so like uh is i mean is very much like a manifesto in the way it's written it's so easy to read that and come away and go like yes that is what the world is like. That is what the world is like right now and want to sort of apply it um, mm. wholesale to the work as it presently exists. And I think I think you're right. It's about trying to pull some of those um, some of those useful, you know, so pulling out recuperation and going, this is a really interesting concept that I can apply to the present day, but also recognising the ways in which, um, because the context has shifted, we might need to uh, apply that in a slightly different way, maybe. Um, yeah. 
I think that's yeah. I think you you put that really really well. Um, uh, I wonder. So I think like so. So you 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 just mentioned that, and that that means that there's lots of lenses that we can apply. And actually, I think we were having a sort of discussion before, and I was sort of mentioning the um uh the the once upon a time sort of there was very fierce theoretical debates about um you know whether one approach uh should top another approach whether um certain theoretical approaches should be not used and you know these are quite contentious things i i sort of remember reading uh men, sort of many years ago and i come back to it every so often is um terry eagleton's literary theory and introduction which um mm. for anyone who wants to sort of read more about approaches to analyzing and engaging and discussing with um i mean anything really it's particularly focused on literature um, but he sort of describes some of these sort of hot debates between, um, you know, like Derrida not getting... No, did he get... I can't remember whether he got the vote for... Was it Cambridge? I can't remember. Um, yeah, yeah, he did. He did eventually. But they wrote that they sort of wrote the letters to the Times and it was like front page news that he wasn't going to... That there was some like uh, people were kicking off that, you know, he wasn't a real uh, uh, scholar. Um, but But our sort of approach to theory is... I, I mean, I would say is slightly different in the present day in that we do tend to view it like you were just saying as a kind of toolbox and go um, mm. sort of, oh, this text that I'm uh, sort of critiquing uh, and would like to say something about and the particular theme that I would like to say something about um, requires me to dig out my uh, my queer theory wrench uh or this metaphor was far more <laughs> far more patronising than I thought it was going to be. Um, but, you know, dig out this particular tool or that particular tool and have the sort of right tool for the right job. Um, uh, is that something that you you find yourself doing as well? Um, or is that, do you have your particular... I mean, obviously within the sort of... I think like you were just saying that you're, you sort of see yourself within that sort of Marxist tradition, um, which I think, I mean, in, in, in many ways... Uh, we're sort of all Marxists now in a in some sense I think and um, mm. that we uh, in that a lot of the approaches we apply have some kind of roots in uh, Marx's work or um, or at least within that tradition I would suggest um, maybe not everything but a, a lot of stuff um, uh yeah, I think I was sort of, sort of um, so maybe wanting to get get to the question of sort of why we apply these tools. What does it what does it mean for us to be able to go um, today? I'm going to use my feminism hammer, um, and tomorrow I'm going to use my uh, screwdriver of uh, uh, post colonialism. That's the only thing <laughs> I could think of. Uh, or my my phenomenology. Um, uh, meter meter rule um <laughs> to, to i don't know maybe to kind of add another unhelpful but hopefully helpful analogy one of my favorite writers china mievel talks about this a lot um and uses uses the term salvage um and salvage is about kind of like jerry rigging it's about kind of like pulling out stuff that might have been broken and you kind of see if you can attach it to something else um and if you think about it in the terms of like uh as a as a rescue mission essentially you know if you were if you were um lost at sea in in wreckage what you would need to do is you would need to salvage stuff from the wreck to help you um survive and i think maybe that's 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 increasingly that's how i find myself thinking about it um, theoretical work is a kind of salvaging. So we go into, uh, you know, the, the the history of radical thought or, or culture, and we try and pull the bits out that we think might be useful here and now. And that doesn't mean that we kind of like abandon or try and erase stuff. You know, it's about what can we what can we pull together here and now from what we have on hand, in order to kind of help us move forward. So that's 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 one of the reasons that I think having a kind of multidisciplinary, if we want to use the kind of slightly more academic way of putting it, 
way of looking at things is really important. We want to be able to draw from as many useful sources as possible to help us reach a kind of fuller and deeper understanding of where we are, solutions to possible problems that we might be facing, and new kinds of uh, knowledge and new understandings of the things that we encounter. Mm, I think I, th- I think that's that's really interesting. The idea of like salvaging stuff it feels very present in some kind of strange way, but um, mm. maybe that's just serving. Sort of yeah, um, it, it just in this sort of weird time of crisis. Um, uh, yeah, uh, although uh, yeah, I feel like our, our the last ten years have been a time of uh, perpetual crises. Anyway, but um, uh, <laughs> that kind of and 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 often yeah, and in a weird way reflects the feeling. Um, of often reaching into the past, that notion of salvaging being something, digging up something from way back when, or that's, you know, maybe rusting a little bit. Um, I think for me, there's something about having that ability to focus in on stuff and and be able to go, um, I want to focus on this particular thing today. And that doesn't mean that the other stuff doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that I don't, it doesn't mean that if I want, I don't know. If I, I'm trying to think of an example. I'm not going to be able to think of one. If um, I can, have you have you watched uh, Normal People yet? I have not. No. No. Oh, it's, it's good. I enjoyed. I quite enjoy Sally Rooney's work. Um, uh, uh, and the 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 TV adaptations uh, quite good. It the the book the book is very political. Um, and there's there's an opening shot. I part of me wanted to make a video about it, but I'm not sure if it's very, very uh uk and ireland or whether or yeah and what the audience that would that would be um thereby going back to the whole thing about um art and and money i suppose um Mm. but uh the 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 tv program has this one shot in it where in the book uh he takes off a copy of um communist manifesto off the shelf and they have this little joke about it or something um and it's sort of the sort of theme stated moment of the whole book wherein um, the whole thing is about class essentially um, and on the tv sh- program it's a little bit blurred um, and you can sort of see he's holding a book and if you know what it is you can sort of see it and i tend to think the tv show is a bit like that the whole way through that the politics is still there but a bit a bit blurrier um although maybe that's because it's not got that sort of inner monologue to it and it's more of an experienced um class the more about the experience of class because it's acted and rather than um yeah, us having that internal that sort of internal monologue from the characters. Um, but with that, like, I think there's sort of very much two ways you could approach it. You could go, I want to take a class approach to it. You could go, I want to take a feminism approach to it. As you know, the sort of way it pairs the two characters together is very much that um, he is uh, sort of finds going to an elite university really difficult because um, of his. Uh, sort of class position and sort of having to try and exist in a world of people who are infinitely wealthier um and uh marianne the woman in it finds it um you know su- suffers a huge amount on on but on uh, as a result of her gender and and sort of um sometimes that's violent sometimes that's just being mistreated um and i think what what I find really useful about being able to draw on the sort of wealth or salvage uh, something from the history of uh, all theory that's ever been written is actually that thing of just being able to go and focus in and go, I, I really want to discuss this one thing. Um, and that doesn't mean I don't think that other stuff matters. It doesn't mean that that's not worth discussing, but, but that for today, I want to talk about class in normal people um, and that, that means and the, sometimes the, the the theory gives you the the reason to do that i think and to really focus mm. in um your your thoughts on that on a particular strand of stuff um and that doesn't necessarily mean you couldn't take a very different approach to it on a different day or um or if you were taking a different stab at it uh for a different audience or whatever uh, yeah absolutely and of course those different ways of looking at things are not necessarily contradictory, right? There's no contradiction between, uh, and in fact, some of mm. the some of the best work in a Marxist tradition is um, from feminists, mm. from feminist writers who are talking about the ways in which um, material forces and misogyny and gender oppression and gender discrimination are all interrelated. So I think I think you're absolutely right, but I I think it's important to state that like having multiple ways of 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 
looking or, or seeing a text or reading a text is not the same thing as having contradictory ways of reading a text. Mm -hmm. um, those things actually all inform one another um, and, and kind of deepen your appreciation and understanding of something overall. Of course, there are just just because there are multiple ways that you can read it doesn't mean every single reading is equally valid, of course, mm -hmm. um, because some of those ways of reading will have criteria of judgment which exclude others. So, for example, it's pretty difficult to um, have a uh, be a cultural materialist and then think, you know, the divine right of kings is just a mandate from heaven. Uh, that there's a contradiction. Um, and one has to be one one necessarily refuses the other but to be a cultural materialist and someone who is interested in anti-fascist struggle or in um, uh, racial and gender equality are not contradictory in the slightest and those multiple approaches all work together towards a towards similar ends and maybe i mean maybe that's back to that um to mayville's uh, analogy of uh, salvaging that actually um i think the way the way we often introduce uh different approaches to uh, whether it's to students in university setting or whether it's um you know me putting together a video on my channel uh or um is that uh you know we do go here's this stuff here's that stuff and we sort of put it into boxes which maybe um maybe is the best way of drawing out a key thread in some stuff but um actually maybe Maybe we should make more of the blurred lines between and the ways in which um, things intersect or ways in which uh, different approaches are informed by each other or can be used together. Um, I mean, like you say, like, I mean, we've talked a lot uh, in the early part of, of this video about um, the ways in which about sort of money and art and you can use that approach and then use that through a, a gendered lens, say, and you could go... Um, you know, here's, uh, you know, uh, I mean, very much in the in the vein of uh, if that speech in Little Women where she talks about um, how, you know, she can't do art because because that's a thing that that men are paid to do. She's not going to get paid to do it, so she she can't choose to do it. Um, and that's possibly yeah. There's possibly numerous examples of how you can um, that we that we tend to leave till much later, maybe, that actually when we're introducing stuff, we tend to go, you know, you either, you know, we treat it as separate tools, like my awful patronising uh, toolkit uh, analogy. Um, uh, but actually, there's so much crossover that maybe treating it like different tools is less useful because sometimes you can use the hammer with the um, wrench. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just found a good quote. There's a, there's a quote that I really like from Ways of Seeing, which illustrates this exactly. Um, where Berger, there's a whole chapter in the book where Berger talks about the tradition of the nude um, mm. in, in Western painting. Uh, and specifically the point that um, female nudes were often painted with mirrors. Uh, and quoting now, the mirror was often used as a symbol of the vanity of women. The moralizing, however, was mostly hypocritical. You painted a naked woman because you enjoyed looking her, at her. You put a mirror in her hand and you called the painting vanity, thus morally condemning the woman whose nakedness you had depicted for your own pleasure. So he's referring there to, to a combination of this sort of moralizing misogyny and uh, a particular aesthetic art tradition. But at the same time, all of that is bound up within these wider economic forces, which, which are... Um, hugely influential on how those things develop mm, i mean you've beautifully brought us back around to uh to ways of seeing that which is excellent i do also want to um i believe bubble boy has asked uh said in the chat if i can find the right thing uh that they went to uh the college where normal people was filmed just out of my own curiosity um i'm, I'm assuming that me that's like uh what is trinity college i think it was filmed at um, but you might have meant like the secondary school uh, that it starts in. That's just if you're still around, let me let me know. I'm ge <laughs> generally just curious. I, I visited Dublin College, though, and it was it's really no Trinity College, and a uh, very nice, very imposing, very imposing place. Um, uh, that was a weird detour. Sorry. Um, that just that just that just that just popped into my eye line, and I got interested. Um, and Starchy also um, sort of talking in, about. Uh, intersectionality for the win um and yeah i think i think in the in the present day we are we are 
ignoring things in a in a bad way if we in, in a bad way that's not a very good way of phrasing it but if we are not recognizing the ways in which um yeah things things uh, uh, oppressions and privileges intersect in multiple ways and the ways in which theories intersect but but we've come back to um to ways of seeing so let's um let's stick with that for our final our final push through this stream um because i think i mean berger essentially presents us with sort of four ways of seeing um uh one of which is sort of looking at reproduction and how context changes the meaning that one takes away um which is a sort of fascinating conversation i think the the ways in which i think and i think one that is perhaps very of the moment in the fact that art galleries are now closed um theaters are closed cinemas are closed lots of the places in which we would often visit things and do it the quote-unquote proper way um are not available to us um and it's it's and I mean, I actually read, I think it was on the Critical Theory subreddit, someone posted a, a thing about uh, about Instagram destroying art. That was that was it. Um, and I think maybe I wish I'd had um, Berger on hand to, to point them towards. Um, uh, and they were talking about, you know, how, and it, and it wasn't just the sort of Instagram traps thing, it was the fact that you don't have to go to the gallery now, you can just see it, you know, the gallery every day posts a different picture that they've got um, and you know is that sort of ruining art because you don't have the experience of um, deciding where you're going to go of getting the bus there or driving there getting the train there uh, getting out paying your paying your uh, entry fee and walking through the thing and reading the thing the little description by the side of it um, uh, yeah so that that lens is that feels very present because that is currently not an option we, we, the only way you can currently see um, the ambassadors, I think. I think that's in the National Gallery in the UK. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. The only way you can currently see the ambassadors is by seeing it online, by Googling mm -hmm. it and seeing it there. Um, and that conversation about does that, does the fact that I can see it on my computer, on my phone screen in Plymouth on a rainy day, rather than having to go to London, does that change the meaning I take away from it? Um he provides us with a, it's a really interesting feminist lens. I particularly like the way he just turns most of the second half of the TV show um, just over to a sort of group of women and goes, and there's something I think really well done about the fact that he goes, here's, they've clearly watched the first half and that he sort of goes, so like anything in that? Anything you want to, um, anything you think's good or not so good? Which is kind of, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and I think make sure that 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 part doesn't just speak for women, but also sort of recognizes their experience as well. Um, yep. He provides us. I'm trying to think what the third. Oh, and then so so then sort of the third frame he provides us with is very much um, uh, art and sort of commissioned art as an expression of wealth and the sort of use of art as a way of going. Look how much stuff or land I have. Um, and you sort of ties that into industrialism uh, and sort of enclosure a, a, a little while ago. Um, and then the fourth sort of being advertising um, and sort of bringing us very much into the uh, present. Um, which, uh, I don't think what the question is to come off the back of that. Um, I suppose which, which, which which of the i think the the part which i um particularly not enjoy and i think i said this earlier is the way he really views this as a democratizing process he goes um he goes actually this is this is so much more of a embracing way of seeing it and i think for me it's the fact that you can see viewing it viewing art as a kind of record of social history is which i would sort of suggest is one of the things that he does among many one of the things he salvages i suppose um allows you to see the the people that aren't there i'm not sure if yeah. that makes sense but but um so thinking about um i can't remember what, what's the painting called where they're looking the couple are looking across their large tracts of newly enclosed land 
Oh, uh, it's um, it's a Gainsborough, but for the life of me, I can't remember. Okay, the, uh, the, what it's called. You, I mean, you're much closer than I am. Um, there is a Gainsborough. Um, but yeah, so I think there's something about being able to um see it through that lens of enclosure. Um, even though it is a portrait of the powerful people who have managed to um get hold of that land. Um, in fact, I don't know how they decided who got which bits of land during enclosure. Um, I don't know whether that was like a tell Sid privatization campaign or something, but um, uh, I th but but the fact that looking at it through that lens, you can also even in their absence recognize the commoners that were turfed off that land and can no longer graze their cattle there, um, mm -hmm. and I think for for me that's the the thing, and also just sort of telling those stories. Yeah, I really really enjoy the bit where in the I think it's the second episode of the TV programme where he just sits in with a group of women and they talk through these concepts of, like, the difference between being naked and being nude um, and the difference between, like, being in front of the mirror and preparing yourself for... And, uh, you know, these women talk about preparing themselves for the eyes of men and asking, are they looking at themselves through uh, men's eyes? Um, uh I'm trying to think what the sort of point I was trying to get to now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, th I think for, for, for me, what I really enjoy about um, about ways of seeing is that real democratization thing. Um, I mean, you you sort of give some biographical context to, to Berger in your video, um, which uh, I was not aware of at all, but which, which made it really interesting. And actually, you linked it to his really radical uh, politics and a little bit to his work as a, a sort of author of um uh, mo sort of books i suppose like novels um or but but this sort of, you talk about his 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 later book um the seven something what was it called the seventh man the seventh man yeah. um as like being a real collage of his um uh his theoretical work and his novel work uh, or sort of artistic works, probably the correct word. Um, how, d yeah, how does that sort of get drawn in? I've not read it. How does that get drawn into his last? So, like the, I think the thing that I, I, I really like about Berger is that he always saw himself as a storyteller. That was his, that was his function, and to be a good storyteller, to um to be someone who can kind of pass on information you have to be really good at listening mm -hmm. so that that point where he uh there's a point in the in uh, one of the first episodes of ways of seeing where he sits down with a bunch of children and asks them to kind of tell tell him what they think about um a caravaggio painting um and there's that that great scene where he's he's talking uh with uh those women and he was always he was always someone who was really genuinely sincerely interested in other people and he had his kind of political and intellectual commitments which i think everybody does but i, I think what he was interested in uh increasingly as as kind of time went forward was the people who are not listened to and the people who are not heard and what would happen to how we understood ourselves if we were able to look and listen to those who were not traditionally included. Mm. So a seventh, a seventh man is um, a collaboration he did with a photographer, um, and is about the experience of migrant laborers, uh, laborers from North Africa and Turkey and Eastern Europe moving into uh, Western Europe. Because at the time, uh, the analogy is like there's the the seventh man is the laborer, the immigrant, the person who is ignored. Um, and it's a, this combination of like a photo montage, almost like a visual diary um, of their of why they've had to leave their home, um, where they're going, what they're, how they're treated when they get there, some sort of theoretical reflections and a lot of economic statistics about Europe in the 70s. Um, it's a really it's a really, I think, a really important book. Um, and actually deeply moving it sold it it, it didn't do very well over here because people didn't really know what to make of it that uh it's basically like a film that you carry around with you mm. um but in places like turkey it's one of the books that berger is best known for um and i think there is something incredibly important to this 
democratizing impulse this idea that if we look and listen at the world we we'll find new stories we if we're willing to because listening takes a degree of humility right it takes it takes the willingness to to sit in silence and let the let let the other person the other people that you're with speak and you might not understand so you might have to get them to tell you again um but i think that's maybe the big takeaway and that's why i i uh think berger is a really interesting figure is that he was a, a this this person who was always deeply interested in listening to others so he um he made he wrote novels about the farming community in europe which is which was often very ignored he wrote about um migrant labor he wrote about um palestinian struggles um so he was uh, prisoners he wrote about animal rights he was very interested in uh, precisely because of that impulse to democratize culture to 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 find a place that everyone can speak and be heard um that's what he was really interested in and i mean there's there's something something i think that echoes almost that conversation that he has um about uh, the 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 the, new, the uh, being naked and being nude you know and, and naked just being yourself um you know all the curtains are closed and you're in in a room on your own and you're just naked and and nude as being something where you are seen and therefore are a sort of object to be perceived by a perceiver um and i think that sort of echoes that thing about listening is that um berger is trying to see through the uh, loud voice of the artist who has painted this uh, has sort of almost spoken over the the woman who has had to present herself there as um, as as a model maybe as 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 a nude or or that has come from their imagination and he's actually trying to exhort us to sort of listen to the the, the woman that's there and ask actually um, is this the way that she presents herself or is there a lived experience behind that that is not the same as the one we are presented with? Um, like like the example of the putting a mirror in her hand and uh, calling her calling her uh, very narcissistic um, uh, and trying to listen to the the unheard voice that's that's even in the work that that already exists. Um, we're just going to go to a couple of questions in the chat before we sort of wrap up we've gone a few minutes over i'm afraid i hope that's okay john that you're not, yeah, not, got, not got some tea going cold or anything um <laughs> th thank you for everyone's wonderful uh point points in the chat it's been it's been great um i mean august uh dennis asking i hope i pronounced that correctly um sort of asking should art be in a museum or should art be in one's home should it music be on a cd or should music be in a pub um i mean i think the, the conversation we we've, we've sort of been having is that Maybe the question to ask isn't should, it's more the more interesting question to ask is how does it affect music, say, to be listened to on a CD in comparison to uh, having it on a stream, you know, Spotify or whatever on your phone? And that not necessarily that there's one thing that's superior to the other, just that the aesthetic experience is different like i know that i get a very different experience from if i put a record on just because i mm. approach it differently like the audible quality probably isn't much different definitely that i can tell um i don't know if you guys thought thoughts on that john i think yeah i think it's possibly the more the more interesting question is to ask how is the experience changed rather than yeah which gets I mean, five stars i always get experience. i i always get i always get slightly wary around prescriptive questions right should should it be there and i think um is, is, from a critical point of view my question is well what does it mean that it is there mm. you know uh, should it be should art be in a museum or should it be in in, in homes yes is my <laughs> answer um but the meaning and the the function that art will be doing will be different depending upon those contexts and the reasons why we might think that art should be in galleries is probably worth investigating rather than being uh, elsewhere. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, should should music be on a CD or in a pub? Yeah, yes, it, it you know, that's fine. That, but I don't know if that kind of questioning takes us far enough. Mm. I think it's much more interesting to talk about 
what does it mean that we you know that we value certain cultural forms over others that you know uh folk songs that you might hear and local songs that you might hear down the pub are not seen as being kind of the high cultural form of something that you would only hear in a concert hall Mm. and it isn't about kind of recreating new hierarchies but actually having a better appreciation of those cultural forms so yeah i i get a bit skeptical a bit kind of suspicious around prescriptive questioning of like should we be doing things like this i think it's much more interesting to go well why are we doing things the way that we're doing them at the moment <laughs> and i think I, I think you're right to bring in the question of like sort of power in there as well that um i know that if like uh if a big band brought out uh i'm trying to think of a bit of big band now brought out something on tape i'd probably find it and we're like you can only listen to this on cassette player i'd probably find it a bit irritating but i know there used to be like a, a local band around here that used to only release things on cassette tape and i kind of found it quite cool um and yeah. like because it because of the awkwardness of it you couldn't just listen to it on the internet you had to like dig out a tape player from somewhere and then try and see if the batteries had rotted and um and it wasn't yeah, and it wasn't good because it was like a better, um, you know, because I was putting the time aside. It just changed the quality of it. And that was the reason it was interesting rather than... Mm. Um, and I think if... I think that there's there's ways in which that could have been done uh, where I would have been like oh, a bit sceptical of it. Um, mm. I think if, if it had been like, because cassettes are the only way to listen to proper music or you're not a proper music fan, um, I'd have been a bit like, Hmm. but that wasn't the way it was presented the way it was presented was just um we're not like and, and they weren't a famous band they were just like we're, it sort of came across with the message of like we're a tiny band and we don't really care um uh, we're not even going to try and like make it or whatever we're just gonna um do really awkward things uh and like give out tapes rather than cds which was kind of cool um yeah totally and uh Oh, that sort of, uh, oh, I'm going to go to this last point before we wrap up by uh, Starcheat, which says, uh, in that case, is there a way to make an objective or at least non-subjective judgment about art or more precisely the story an artwork tells? Um, I suppose I'm trying to find an objective, uh, objective criticism of art. I mean, it's hard to make an objective criticism about art, I would say. Like, you can't... Um, I suppose you can establish some very basic facts about when it was made, when it was, you know, um, the, um, I suppose, suppose the, the, the division is always going to be the, the difference between the value that it has in the more holistic sense and the price that it is sold for. Um, like there's, there's going to be things which split along that binary of numbers that you can put to stuff, but that not always aligning to um a more holistic or artistic sense of value about something um and, mm. and in the same way you can yeah you can put a date on when something's made but you can't necessarily you probably can't even quantify the impact that it had um other than i'm sure art galleries will tell you how many people have gone to see one painting over another i'm sure they've got like um ways of uh tracking where people go in uh you know which are the the big hitters um well the oh sorry as i was saying i meant a judgment about the ethics of a story being told um and i mean that's always going to be a, a difficult one i think that we can only argue till the end of time about um about who has the right to uh tell certain certain stories um but i quite like uh Burgess' approach, which you've been describing to us, John, about listening, is nice. Um, yeah, particularly. The... And and also, and also, I think that conversation is maybe more important than whatever conclusion you end up at. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, having, as you say, we could talk about that until the till the end of time, till the heat death of the universe. <laughs> but but so doing means that we take art seriously and mm. that we see it as something that is bound up within the kind of lived experience and the the social and political totality in which we exist so like i actually think having those conversations and and listening is a damn good start is um is maybe the best place to start with that excellent well i'm gonna begin to uh 
wrap up our conversation that we've been having. Um, thank you so much. There's been such a fa fascinating, um, very in-depth uh, conversation, John. Thank you so much for uh, being so eloquent. And uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't have complained if you weren't eloquent and, and well-read. <laughs> uh, but uh, in fact, the one thing when I'm emailing people uh, to see if they'll be be guests so one thing i'm always like is like you like seriously you don't have to be like super you don't have to be like drawing quotes out all the time but you you have been so thank you very much i'm sure everyone watching has learned at least something uh today i know i have uh so thank you so much for uh joining me and uh us everyone very dialectical of you star chester saying john um <laughs> uh more interested in furthering the dialectic than coming to any kind of synthesis um mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people find you if they uh, if they are not already uh, immersed in your expanded universe? Um, the the Liquid Guy expanded universe. You can find me on Twitter at the Liquid Guy. Um, please do check out the podcast as well. Um, that is where I spend a lot of my time talking. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well. Um, the Berger video um, had a few technical problems, but I think I've solved those for my next. Uh, uh, round of videos that will be coming soon and you can find me there as the Licrit guy too i'm pretty much the Licrit guy everywhere um <laughs> but thank you everyone for such great questions and um thank you so much tom for inviting me on it's been absolutely it's been absolutely fantastic everyone saying thank you and and stuff in the chat thank you all for joining us um yeah uh, and uh if you would uh if you want to see more of these then make sure that you are subscribed to my tom nicholas uh live channel um because i keep these in a separate internet zone uh but uh yeah if you've somehow stumbled across this without um, my main stuff or if you are a fan of uh, john's who has popped along then um do also check out the videos that i have prepared and edited as well as just these um <laughs> these these conversations um yeah if you would like to uh so if you're a fan of, fan of my work and would like to support uh, then you can do so on Patreon. But actually, I mean, this month, find a bail fund or something, like uh, drop some money there. Or um, I know if you're in the UK, uh, the Black Lives Matter UK have a, um, a fundraising page on GoFundMe, I think, at the moment. Uh, and I'm sure they could use your money much better than I could. Um, but yeah, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John. I think that is all the wrapping up things uh, done. So thank you very much uh, for coming along, everyone. Once again, I'll leave the chat open for a very short period in case anyone wants to say goodbye to each other. Um, and I'll be back with another one of these at some point, probably in two weeks. That seems to be the schedule. But thank you very much once again. Uh, and yeah, have a good evening or morning or whatever time it is where you are. <laughs>